Hello there. Uh, this is Taras Viktorovich Pluskin uh, from the University of Florida. And this is the second part of my casual detritivore series on worms and their potential applications in aquaculture. Uh, part two, we will be covering the uh, applications and prospects of aquaculture of California blackworms, Lumbriculus variegatus. Uh, the last talk was tube effects, tube effects, um, and these are not the same thing. Um, and should not be confused. They are entirely different uh, genuses altogether. Now, believe it or not, what got me uh, interested to start this series of talks was a uh, local deficit of blackworms at my local pet store. Um, blackworms are a very common, um, popular live feed uh, in the aquarium industry. And me and my girlfriend in particular uh, like to use them to feed our fish, especially if we're trying to get to, them to breed or to uh, add extra layer of diversity to our aquaria. Um, so we went into our local pet store um, right around the time the California wildfires uh, started to happen. Uh, this is being recorded in October 2020. And uh, they said that uh, basically there had been a, a series of calamities um, with many of the producers and supply had drastically fallen below demand and that uh, only the most loyal of customers were going to be receiving limited shipments of black worms and that the regular customer base would not be able to receive uh, regular shipments until at least November. Uh, so I went online and did a little bit of sleuthing um, uh, from the major suppliers uh, that I could at least find. Um, the ones that were available were clearly out of stock of most of their product and what product they did have was very expensive and limited. Um, as you can see here, an announcement um, that they only plan to return to regular production around November. Um, so apparently they have some seeding process with their ponds and the ponds require a certain amount of time to reach critical harvestable mass. Um, and then of course, uh, I included here some forums, which if you're part of the aquarium uh, industry, um, you know, forums are everything when it comes to acquiring the latest anecdotal knowledge and rumors. Um, and it sees here that, you know, everywhere, the Michigan, the California region, everywhere is um, receiving a deficit of black worms. And uh, this is certainly being felt among the hobbyists who, especially during the time of the pandemic, uh, really want to rely um, on, on, on their hobby and the distraction of their fish tanks. So we see here a classic situation of, of the collapse of, of supply um, in the face of rising, um, if not steady demand, um, and this should be addressed. Um, so a brief description of black worm uh, producers in the United States. Uh, there's few and far between, uh, at least as far as relative to even producers of other ornamental uh, associated uh, species and livestock. Um, basically, the ones that exist serve to uh, fuel local pet stores and uh, wholesalers, uh, as well as uh, biological supply companies, as the major uses for blackworms at this moment is as fish feed, live fish feed, or dried fish feed, and as uh, research organisms. Um, so there's uh, a, a couple producers, quite a few, most of them are in uh, California. Um, and then one or two in Florida, and then uh, I was able to find one contact in, in Pennsylvania. Um, so uh, they mainly support these industries, like I said, which is a limited and uh, reliable market. But there, there doesn't appear, at least um, to my knowledge, to be a, a real focus when it comes to upscaling this, when it comes to uh, any sort of other industrial synergy. And that's probably a regulatory issue uh, on top of... Um, you know, other things. Um, and then mainly the form of production is outdoor ponds, uh, with the exception of hoop houses and perhaps the occasional tank based uh, production system. But mainly these systems are outdoor ponds uh, uh, fed mainly by some companies advertise that they, they feed there's a special pellet feed, others don't specify, uh, making me believe that perhaps they're depending on more natural production. But uh, mainly these are outdoor ponds and they are susceptible to the elements um, and the, the plethora of wild organisms that are out there. And of course, um, uh, fluctuations in temperature as uh, rising temperatures um, 
or what several producers told me were responsible for their the collapse of their uh their their ponds simply the ponds hit greater than 90 degrees and became anoxic and, and the worms could not sustain that and and all perished um so basically uh we see here uh, a situation where uh we have an industry that is by no means um undiscovered but uh, is still relatively in its infancy as far as uh, the, the full potential plethora of its application and uh, the, the refinement of its production practices. So with the general context in mind, uh, we are dealing with an organism which at the moment has far less supply than it does demand. Um, let's begin to talk about the actual biology of the organism. So Lumbriculus variegatus is an oligarchy analyte. Uh, inhabits uh, nutrient-rich streams, uh, brooks, uh, the edges of marshes, ponds. It's very versatile, um, but it does have a fairly, um, it does have the requirements that it requires a good deal of flow and it requires uh, a constant supply of protein-rich uh, sludge or detritus. Um, so it does have, it is a mixed trophic detritivore. Um, so studies in the wild have uh, determined that wild populations um, consume microalgae that either falls from suspension or is dying or benthic uh, microalgae, which grows in the, the sediment uh, anyway, um, primarily in the summer. So it, it preferentially feeds on microalgae when given the option. Um, and then during the winter, uh, it will switch over to a uh, diet mainly of detritus and bacteria, switching to lower quality uh, reserves of, of proteins. But it is highly versatile in its diet, which makes it a very um, attractive candidate for, for, for food waste management. Um, so it is native to North America, but uh, it is suspected that it, it might have been uh, introduced, uh, it might be native to um, Europe, but but it is known to have been introduced worldwide, wherever it's its temperature range of not, of not you know, too warm. It doesn't like, you know, greater than 84 degrees um, and, 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 and not too cold. Um, you know, it obviously can't, can't freeze in the Arctic, but, but it has expanded its, its range considerably. Um, but there are at least three uh, distinct genetic clades that have been identified. Um, there are uh, the first two clades, which have been identified as the predominant ones, which reside over the North American and European um, and Asian populations, um, at least how their native or introduced range have been. And then the, a distinct third clade, which uh, is isolated to the Sierra Nevada mountains. Now, upon um, analysis of mitochondrial DNA uh, variants, it's been determined that these are most likely uh, distinct evolutionarily divergent populations that should be considered uh, different species. So the, the concept of Lumbriculus variegatus will most likely be challenged as a species in the future, uh, especially when it comes to the, the likely discovery of future isolated uh, populations such as the one in, in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Uh, some notes about the functional biology of Lumbriculus variegatus. Uh, they have uh, a clear uh, anterior and posterior end. Um, they have a mouth uh, uh, used for feeding, which you see in the center photograph, um, which is uh, far more uh, pigmented. Um, then they also have a tail, uh, which is used uh, primarily uh, as a respiratory device. So they will, they will stay position themselves and use their tail, um, to protrude into the flow and absorb as much oxygen as they can. Um, and if possible, and if given the choice, they will protrude their tail and extend and make their cytoskeleton as rigid as possible so that they can keep their tail above the water, uh, surface so that they can, uh, tap direct oxygen from the air. Um, they possess high levels of uh, hemoglobin-like pigment called uh, urethrocorion, and it will turn red in times of low oxygen when it concentrates. Um, the, it also has a series of photoreceptors scattered across its roughly 200 to 250 
body segments. Um, and this allows it to have the rough interpretation of, 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 of light. So its uh, behavior is negatively phototactic. When you, when you shine the light on it, it will shy away from the light, um, but it will also be able to tell light sources uh, from dark sources. Um, and this is very interesting, um, not so much with the individual worms, but when you have a considerable biomass um, growing together, like you see in the photos to the left and the right, you can see that they almost have a group behavior where the organisms uh, feed collectively as one almost. And then uh, as you can see in the right, this is from one of my um, home cultures. Um, you can see here that uh, when placed in a con shallow container with uh, <clears throat> no aeration, um, a worm biomass uh, that is running out of uh, oxygen will accumulate its uh, pigments, its respiratory pigments, and start to turn quite dark, as you can see, and then will collectively raise towards the surface and even start to support each other in an effort to uh, collectively breach the water surface tension and uh, breathe. Um, so this is very interesting uh, group collective behavior with these organisms. Some notes on the life cycle of Lumbriculus variegatus. Uh, it has a sexual life cycle, um, like other annelids. Um, one that is not extremely well observed, though it has been uh, repeated um, while intentionally in laboratory culture. Um, though uh, there's speculation that it's far more practiced in the worm's native range, quote unquote. Um, but uh, it is uh, observed that the sexual reproduction um, is much like other annelids. They are asynchronous hermaphrodites uh, growing sperm and egg oppositely so that they, um, they can only fertilize each other and not themselves. Um, and then they will produce cocoons full of eggs, which will hatch into juveniles um, without any uh, planktonic larval state. Uh, they uh, predominantly have an asexual uh, life cycle where um, one that is both incidental and uh, intentional. Uh, the incidental is if you were to, let's say, sever a worm uh, down the middle, that was done in, as was done with the specimen at the bottom. Um, the two severed parts, uh, body segments, would then reproduce as their own individual worms and then develop um, as their own. So each body segment has the ability to convert itself into an adult organism. So theoretically, each organism has the ability to multiply itself 200 to 250 times um, just by being chopped up into itty bitty little bits. Um, now, this does not have to be done to reproduce the organism. It will do it on its own in a process called uh, morphalaxis, where uh, body segments will be strategically uh, detached at certain points um, by various different mechanisms um, and then this has a variety of, uh, you know, through a variety of environmental contexts, um, the worm will choose to attach various parts of its body to reproduce into other parts of the worm. Um, so as a result of understanding uh, these mechanisms of morphalaxis, uh, bio, worm biomass could theoretically be inc increased exponentially quicker um, than just incidentally letting them do whatever. Uh, so Lumbriculus variegatus has traditionally been used as a model organism for sediment toxicology studies. Um, most of the studies used around Lumbriculus uh, has been around for this purpose, um, seeing, uh, demonstrating that it uh, is capable of uh, accumulating heavy metals. Um, it has been demonstrated uh, through bioassays that uh, Lumbriculus will stop feeding when exposed to various toxicants at various thresholds. Um, and it has been used to communicate toxicants to fish uh, in a biological context through feed. So they feed the toxicants in the sediment to the worms and then feed the fish to the, feed the worms to the fish and then try and see if the toxicant is communicated or bioaccumulated, etc. cetera. Uh, and what's really interesting about these studies is that they do have some uh, valuable application towards future cultivation efforts. You know, these various thresholds are vital to understanding what types of food waste 
can actually be utilized uh, by by the worms. Uh, what kind of industrial waste can be utilized, and what the ramifications are as far as having the the worst parts of that waste accumulate in the worm biomass. The other major established use for black worms is in ornamental aquaculture. Uh, for decades, it has been embraced by traditional fish culturists as a reliable, dependable live feed uh, that can be easily cultured in the home aquaria and that a variety of fish, regardless of finickiness, or feeding strategy uh, tend to really, really enjoy. So a few examples have been uh, put at the bottom. Um, so we see axolotls being used uh, for live, uh, being fed live black worms. We see a, a rare chocolate catfish, and then of course some nice pigeon blood uh, discus really enjoying um, a big ball of lumbr lumbriculus. Uh, so they're very visually attractive uh, They stay alive in the freshwater aquaria so they don't foul the water if you feed too much but rather they will turn the fish waste that is in the sediment the bacteria that's in the sediment living off the fish waste they'll turn that back into biomass the fish can then uh, eat and most likely the worms will bury and expose themselves to get as much oxygen as possible the fish will only be able to bite off the tip and thus you will be able to reproduce worms inside the aquaria with proper cycling unless you have a highly efficient uh, ben benthic uh, predator species like a catfish um, they usually get them all um, it has been demonstrated that they do have the potential to retain polyunsaturated fatty acids and therefore they are a, a partial uh, replacement for fish meal especially with freshwater species they therefore really do have the ability to take some of that fish waste and, and reincorporate some of the, some of that waste some of that detritus some of that valuable fish meal that otherwise would go down the drain they can reconvert into valuable biomass with polyunsaturated fatty acids which at the end of the day is a thing that we really need to get into our fish regardless of if we're trying to look at them for beautiful colors or if we're trying to grow them quickly for market or if we're trying to have the best healthy filet for our home family. Where lumbriculus has been far less embraced has been in the sector of food aquaculture in the United States. Uh, most of its use has been done in a laboratory mainly to see, again, if, if various toxicants has been, have been applied uh, to sediments and what the threat are. Um, and then theoretically, it's, it's been fed, you know, for instance, it's been fed to Mexico sturgeon um, in trials. It's been fed to rainbow trout um, to see, uh, to test its efficacy as a feed. Um, but, but other areas where it would obviously have some application um, and find, you know, greater value I would be, you know, catfish farming, for instance, it would be a, a great mechanism for recycling their waste back into usable biomass, increasing the potential margins there if the engineering is, is the bioengineering is used effectively. And then perhaps and even in bioflock systems, uh, such as Macrobrachium rosenbergi, I mean, these, these freshwater prawns that can be raised very, very quickly, but also produce a fair amount of waste. You know, it'd be another mechanism for being able to recycle their waste back into a tangible feed source. So there are, there, there are many avenues, I believe, for freshwater aquaculture in the United States to utilize black worms to make their fin fish aquaculture have less of an ecological impact and have increased uh, FCRs with greater efficiency of inputted fish meal capital. So here's an example from uh, a study where lumbriculus was used to feed rainbow trout in a trial. Uh, so we see here that the main nutritional profile of lumbriculus is overwhelmingly in the realm of protein. Uh, most of its diet uh, is suspected to be derived from protein hydrolysis, though this is not uh, certain. Um, though we see that that's predominantly uh, the buildup of the worm tissue, very low in fat um, in other products relatively. It doesn't have the chitin that other organisms do. It doesn't have the shell that other organisms do. Uh, so therefore, 
the amount of usable biomass that can be extracted from lumbriculus uh, is maximized when it's when it's being fed whole uh, to organisms such as food or ornamental fish. And when we start to talk about the efficiency of lumbriculus when it comes to the usable biomass that you end up with, uh, it segues to the, 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 the true hidden worth of lumbriculus, in my opinion, which is not exactly as an ornamental or a laboratory specimen species. I mean, that industry is, is surely there and might expand modestly, uh, but, but, but truly I think its potential expansion is as a bioremediation organism where it can be used to capture the waste from our cultural, aquacultural, and industrial efforts, utilize that waste as biomass that can then be used to feed a variety of other industries. Uh, so to take that more biomass um, and, to, and to really <clears throat> be able to, to, to scale it up to the scale where where waste stops becoming a liability and, and, and progresses towards becoming a strategic asset for a company to, have to, to choose how to manage, which is where ultimately everyone agrees that our economy needs to go for both profitability and ecological stability. Uh, so uh, not to go on a tangent, but um, the umbrellicus, uh, it's been demonstrated that it can be fed the food waste of both vegetable, animal, and bacterial origin. Um, it can convert this food waste into highly compact worm feces, uh, which can fairly easily be managed, uh, strained, and processed compared to uh, the original sludge, which the worm uh, is given, uh, high, uh, increase, high, making uh, downstream waste processing much more efficient um, with the byproduct of a, of a, prof, of a worm biomass. Um, and depending on the sludge composition it's given, it can double every seven days which uh, is actually much better than um, controls of organic material from wild territory, which takes a doubling time of 10 to 40 days. Uh, so depending on uh, the waste that they're given, Lumbrilicus uh, basically uh, just eats it all up and frankly can become a suitable partner species for humanity that can absorb our, our gluttonous waste because it itself has its own gluttony in a sense. So I love to end with my my, my three photos, which is, you know, we can take great big piles of shit, turn them into worms, and then turn those worms, mill them into, into usable, long-term, storable biomass that can re-enter re the industry safely and, and necessarily turn a profit while doing so to, to keep everything sustainable in every sense of the word. So I really wanted to include this figure from La Roven et al. 2013 that really displays the possible efficiency of blackworm biomass. We see here a number of conventional aquaculture and agricultural products, you know, uh, carp, chicken, pork, beef biomass. And we also have, of course, the, the production of milk and egg uh, products. Um, and we see here, uh, two things that are very, very important. So the, the green is the feed conversion ratio. So this is the rough efficiency just of producing the product itself, like the, as a whole, the whole egg, the, the everything. Um, and we see here that milk is relatively efficient, even though it's very wasteful with water. Uh, carp is, is relatively efficient. You know, even that number can be brought down even to one, uh, even with salmonids with proper uh, waste management practices. So they think. Um, and even uh, and with uh, chicken also quite low, and then beef is, is quite wasteful, and then pork as well is also quite wasteful. Um, and then we can see here uh, that uh, the purple category is also uh, quite interesting. So this is the amount of actual usable edible protein, I mean edible biomass that you get, so that you don't eat the, the shell of the egg, for instance. Um, and we see here that with you know, you're, you're really having much less uh, efficiency when it comes to the actual edible biomass that's being produced. Like even be beef and pork, which are already not doing great, start to hemorrhage at this point. Chicken goes up, eggs go up, carp goes up, milk stays the same, obviously. But then we have black worms, which remain constant in both categories and are significantly more efficient uh, than 
than all the other products. Uh, they don't have to use uh, potable water, for instance. Uh, they can be used wastewater that can't go anywhere else. Uh, they can be fed other waste products, and then they can they can metabolize those waste products highly efficiently. Uh, and this can most likely be attributed to the microbiome in their gut, in the microbiome that they uh, perhaps uh, uh, radiate in their outside environment. So if worms are such a desirable product when it comes to waste management, then the cultivation method for scaling up their production, uh, there's a variety of different avenues that could be chosen, each with pluses and minuses, but each should be considered for various applications towards mitigating various forms of waste and for producing worms for various other purposes, such as high quality uh, fish <clears throat> protein or feed, for instance. So the first is the most conventional approach uh, today is pond cultivation. So this is the greatest possible scale. You, you, can, you can produce the most black worms at scale for the lowest capital cost, uh, but you also substitute out that for the lowest amount of environmental control. Um, yes, your worms are enjoying to a degree uh, the ecological surface, uh, services of, of natural production and natural filtration, but uh, they are also... Um, subject to the elements. Thus, if there's a heat wave, you will lose your entire stock and all of a sudden there's a supply deficit across the country. Um, and then also uh, there is the issue of, you know, you're out there in the elements and any sort of organism that comes in contact with your worms uh, not only can communicate their microbiome to it, which could perhaps have harmful bacteria um, or viruses that could end up in your customer's fish tanks or in their experiments, incidentally, um, but the same regard, you could also have, um, you know, various other organisms that could be incidentally brought into your harvesting facilities. You know, I, I, I for instance, always get leeches when it comes to my blackworm orders. Um, they seem to always come in uh, without fail, um, even though they can be killed by placing the culture in the refrigerator. Um, and then there really is the greatest amount of uh, potential for industrial synergy when it comes to pond culture um, because you have these mass scale ponds and they can really be fed wastewater from a variety of different uh, industrial sources and it can just be stacked in a pond. Um, and of course, the second method is tank cultivation, which is which is probably more applicable, A, in the urban environment um, where you have more uh, vertical space and horizontal space, um, but also in an environment where you're trying to produce more controlled worm protein and perhaps higher quality worm protein where you really want to control, um, A, the amount of feed that's going into your worms. You don't want it going to a lot of other wild organisms. Um, and B, you want to control which organisms are coming in contact with your worms. Um, but you really also have to substitute that with the increased cost of labor, the increased cost of materials, and the reduced uh, potential of scale uh, when it comes to uh, even modest tank culture. So reconciliations have been made with controlled hoop houses or greenhouses, like you see on the right, uh, where even in winter conditions, uh, ponds can be raised in relative controlled yet outdoor environments. So there's a lot in, in the middle. And then the last approach, which has been largely unembraced, but perhaps is, 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 will, will be in the future, is the application of Lumbriculus variegatus to recirculation aquaculture technology. Uh, which would uh, imply that Lumbriculus could be actively fed waste products from either A, uh, a recirculation aquaculture system, and then those worms could be fed back into the fish tissue, which would be very interesting. Or B, uh, you could um, you know, have something like Larhoven's uh, reactor up to the top right, where wastewater is continuously streamed through vertical reactors of worms, where worms are A, absorbing the wastewater actively as it gets incorporated into a sand bed, and then B, worms are being actively taken, uh, harvested through this laminar flow and collected, um, and then the lack of that worm biomass is being substituted by, by an encouraging future reproduction. Uh, so there really are many different avenues, and few of them are being em embraced beyond uh, conventional pond culture at the moment, at least to my knowledge. So this is an example of a conventional California blackworm producer. Um, basically, they, they, they 
stout their conventional market, which is you know hatcheries, aquariums, zoos, pet stores, pharmaceutical research companies, etc. So they pride themselves in producing a higher quality worm, and they uh, they, they they stress away from the the waste mitigation aspect of it. But what I want really want to accent on before I move on is this um, seven to day um, cleaning and purging period where they are harvest worms removed from the ponds and placed inside an indoor facility. And I'm very curious, this, um, but was unable to find any methods that would be used to kind of purge the worms uh, besides perhaps just a, a continuous flow of, of clean water. Um, but uh, this surely is a critical state when it comes to utilizing more biomass after it's been fed um, waste of potentially hazardous origin. This is another example of a semi-automated worm production system that I was able to found. So this is a idea of an indoor facility run at a constant 22 degrees Celsius right in the middle of the worm's metabolic range, no lights um, to reduce some costs and heating. And as you can see here, we have lines of um, horizontal worm tanks that are being fed and that have both discharge and harvest collectors where worm feces can be removed to encourage space for more biomass. And at the same time, you can have a, a, an area for, for a biomass to be harvested and uh, assumingly moved into a uh, depuration or processing chamber. And here's a look of an individual unit from this array. Um, where we see that it has two different modes of laminar flow, one which utilizes collection of feces and one which uh, utilizes uh, collection of worm biomass. Um, and this will uh, assumedly have a series of different delivery systems for the waste uh, feed source of choice, and then um, have a mechanism so that uh, this could be delivered to the worms at a constant level. Um, at, so as to encourage the most efficient uh, growth of biomass. So some important cultivation considerations summarized for Limbrilicus. Uh, it's been associated that increased organic carbon levels um, do have higher growth and reproduction for the species. So they really do want a nutrient dense, carbon dense, organic sludgy environment that the, those those kind of rich sediments is what they want but what looks just like sludge to us is not the same you know might not it's it could be a lot of things to them um so balancing and contextualizing the carbon to nitrogen ratio is essential to understanding the full metabolism of these worms and truly understanding ways to uh, maximize their their growth so a study done by larhoven and all in, in 16 um, determined that carbon nitrogen ratios of six to seven were better than higher ratios. Once you got really higher um, to like the 10 to 40 ratios, that's when you started to have depressed, less maximized worm growth and even start to have a little bit of worm die off. Uh, apparently, whatever microbial complex fuels the worm's metabolism inside and out fuels better when the carbon nitrogen is at a moderate level. Um, this was also kind of encouraged and improved upon by the addition of small amounts of agar agar uh, seaweed compound uh, put in and this reduced uh, protein hydrolysis in the feed uh, prior to when the worms could have it so it basically stored the quality of the feed a little bit longer and improved the structure of the feed and captured suspended particles so that they were more available to the worm and this did improve worm growth a little bit went a long way for this um, and they also, uh, a different set of experiments demonstrated that worms grown on the waste of rainbow trout uh, demonstrated an FCR of 1.8. Uh, so they uh, were able to grow um, fairly well simply off the fish waste. And if fed back to the fish, they had a theoretical yield of 0.1 to 0.14 uh, kilograms of, of fish to be produced from a kilogram of fish waste um, as communicated by the worms back into the system. Um, 
again, as stated, something that's very, very important to consider is that it, just because you can utilize all these different waste sources for your worm biomass, you have to consider the nutritional profile of your worms for the application. You know, do you need polyunsaturated fatty acids or are you just trying to get waste mitigated? Um, and if you are using potentially toxic waste and potentially dangerous bacteria associated, how are you going to depurate this worm biomass to ensure the safety and maximum efficacy to other uh, industries? If you can't utilize the worm biomass, the structure of the supply chain no longer becomes attractive. Some more vital cultivation considerations that really need to be considered when it comes to further industrializing the blackworm market. Uh, there are so many considerations when it comes to optimizing sediment and water quality, and this mainly has to do with coordinating the microbial community of the worms once it's better understood. Um, again, the carbon-nitrogen balance is also essential and contextualized through the sediment and the water. Um, uh, and then the, the choice of feed source. Are you going to choose natural production? Are you going to choose sludge, food waste, agricultural waste, fish waste? Uh, what, what is your what is the intention of your worm biomass and therefore which form of waste is best for you to utilize? And how is that cost effective for you? And how is that reconciled with the, the added necessity or lack of necessity of depurating the worms uh, before harvest? Um, and of course, what are the most efficient densities for recruitment? Um, a study was demonstrated that the worms will feed at the same rate regardless of density, so that they, they actually do not, they are not inhibited or stressed out by the presence of each other. But is there a maximum density of worms that is needed to have maximized re-recruitment and uh, refractionation? And then of course, is there are there pathogens that can be communicated to livestock, to humans, to fish that can be vectored by the worms? Unlike tube effects, tube effects, they don't vector whirling disease, um, but are there other pathogens that we need to be aware of and what methods can we take to either purge the worms or keep the pathogens away from those worms in general? And when we're talking about a species that reproduces primarily through asexual reproduction, this also begs the question, you know, are we begging for another pathogen to come in and attack the worms themselves? If they are all of a similar genetic identity throughout these various mass scale farming operations, are we not begging for a virus or a bacteria or a parasite which selectively targets their genotype and has the capability of causing an utter catastrophe once the industry is realized. So this should be analyzed and uh, considered um, beforehand. Uh, as stated again and again and again, again, I, uh, I do apologize for lack of details, but we are on the burgeoning of understanding this, even, even when it comes to the human microbiome. Um, but microbial synergy is paramount to utility in all things, and especially in uh, worm culture. So we must better understand the interconnected functioning of black worms with their associate microbiome. What is the microbiome going on inside their intestines, and how is that microbiome being reflected uh, in their outwards environment? What is the characteristics of the sludge pre and post feeding from the black worms? And once that's developed, how do we how do we develop techniques to select and manipulate that microbiome so that we can we can suit the needs of most efficient waste management? Can we alter the microbiome so that it can take out particularly uh, nasty chemicals or microplastics or things like that? Or can we also uh, affect the microbiome so that it can take uh, and maximize its efficiency? Can we once we identify what it needs? Can we can we feed the engine? And, and, and use these worms to their greatest capability. Um, so in the future, I think it's, it's very important not to think of these just as worms, because you know, at the end of the day, worms themselves are only of so much value, but really to be as a vehicle for this valuable microbiome, which can be used um, as, you know, not to be too indulgent, an alchemy set to convert waste uh, into gold, into, into something of value, which can return back to the industry. And I'll start to wrap up this presentation with a few different potential avenues for polyculture with uh, Lumbriculus variegatus. Uh, since 
this species I have a lot of experience with in my own personal fish tanks and cultivating side cultures of. So one obvious uh, polyculture um, method could be using phytoplankton. Um, phytoplankton, if placed in the right pond, if seeded in the right pond, or if placed uh, under the right cost-effective light in the culture apparatus, uh, could continuously uh, replace um, the invisible suspended inorganic nutrients with accessible biomass that can then be fed, uh, preyed upon by the worms. Um, and uh, various algae species, I have a quick picture of chlorella at the bottom here, can be used to uh, utilize and synthesize polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, so they can take these inorganic invisible things suspended in the water, these nutrients, these trace metals, they can turn them into polyunsaturated fatty acids so their metabolisms uh, grow um, and then die or sink and they can be consumed by the worms and then the worms can accumulate those polyunsaturated fatty acids into their own biomass. Um, so there's a few, quite a few avenues with phytoplankton that can be used to support um, uh, complex uh, polycultures because once uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids are introduced through phytoplankton in the environment and you have nitrogen recycling being actively done with phytoplankton, you can um, add quite a few other organisms. And perhaps uh, uh, as nature has clearly shown us through the example, increase efficiency through increased complexity and diversity. So one natural uh, follow-up um, that I've also uh, done in my own personal cultures is polyculturing uh, blackworms with various freshwater zooplankton. Uh, so I have pictures here of Daphne and Magna, which I have not worked with uh, greatly. Um, but at the bottom, I have uh, cyclopoid copepod species, which I have worked with a ton of these guys. Um, so they're very, very good because they're able to occupy the water column, whereas the worms, uh, though they can swim for limited amounts of time, uh, are limited. They're trapped at the bottom. And these guys uh, remove suspended particles, um, and they're also able to eat, um, uh, remove pests, uh, paramecium, algae, bacteria, um, competitor species. They're able to remove, actively remove uh, competitors of the worm's feed. And as they're feeding on particles that uh, the worms can't access, they are bringing those particles out of suspension and releasing their own feces, which the worms can then uh, feed on. And I've, I've grown uh, several species of, of cyclopoid copepods with these worms, and, and, and I've seen various uh, examples of other people that have grown Daphnia very successfully with black worms, even in, in very simple systems. Um, and what's nice about this is that these live feeds add another significant value-added product to waste mitigation. So these guys are highly efficable. They have um, a huge competency for being able to uh, retain polyunsaturated fatty acids for freshwater organisms, and they can be used for fish feeds. And one last set of polyculture candidates that comes to mind, which I've also uh, done with my personal cultures is uh, the growth of, of various floating uh, small flowering plant species. So particularly members of the duckweed family of the Wolfiaceae and the mosquito ferns of Salviniaceae. Um, these are species which have just uh, recently in the last 20 years have really been identified as uh, producers of polyunsaturated fatty acids, albeit not as good as the, the marine, the ones produced by marine species, but the polyunsaturated fatty acids all the same. And they are potential for biofuel, biofuel feedstock. And anyone who's had um, a species like this in their tanks quickly knows that if you don't manage it properly, um, it can quickly overgrow your tank so that the, the growth capabilities of these guys are tremendous. And they also have a, a great capability of being able to fix nitrogen with their symbiotic bacteria. And uh, they can cycle nitrogen quite well. Um, they can shade the worms, keeping them away from the light. Um, and also act as uh, radiation and heat sink uh, for the worms as well. Um, so I think there are several possible interesting couplings with the right uh, floating firing species and black worm uh, culture as well. So to wrap this presentation up, what are the, the future considerations for black worm aquaculture? Uh, the first is that the many countries, uh, especially in the, the uh, tropical countries and in the United States, um, a broader geographical span of commercial producers should be considered. Uh, this species has a pretty multi 
uh, plicited range and it's already been introduced to a variety of different lands. So perhaps it's time to utilize it in a variety of different lands, um, especially because this could help prevent future production deficits such as the one that we're seeing now. Um, there needs to be a need for acceptance and regulation of worm meal, uh, particularly in the United States, uh, so that we can take this worm uh, protein and have uh, standards for it to be uh, certified and checked so that can be used for livestock uh, feed. Um, uh, through no other means can it truly re-enter um, uh, the right means of uh, industrial production. And then, of course, there needs to be a lot of investigation into depuration technologies and understanding the biological risk. You know, what really can these worms carry? What are the, like, the likely sources of those pathogens? And how can we prevent um, them from occurring within the worms? There needs to be increased synergy between uh, industries particularly wastewater management and worm producers. There needs to be a, a, a knowledge of where these worm producers are and how they can efficiently receive the waste routinely from uh, the producers and a standardization of how that waste is reprocessed. And lastly, there needs to be a lot of considerations for strain selection for desirable characteristics. Uh, firstly, diversity, because there just simply is so much asexual reproduction of the species. Uh, selection for fast growth, reproduction, environmental tolerance, uh, particularly towards heat. Um, polyunsaturated fatty acid retention, um, and then a particular microbiome of choice that would perhaps allow it to metabolize particular waste products more efficiently. And then, um, of course, genetic management and tracking of these various strains so that we can prevent a novel disease outbreak and have uh, disease resistant strains ready to go uh, should this become an industry worth preserving and expanding and therefore uh, securing. So I'd like to thank you all very much for listening to another one of my worm rants. Uh, uh, the next uh, one in the series will be moving on to marine polychaete worms, uh, which have um, their own very exciting quirks. Uh, see you next time.